The power, uh, power supply is okay today, I think. Yes, yes. That is why we didn't have it on. Uh, tomorrow would have been a uh, Yeah, low shedding day. Hello. Huh? So how is Bangalore doing with the COVID? Oh, wait, wait, wait. Uh, I'll tell you. Report in this uh, new huh? virus. Sorry. Yeah. Hmm. Bangalore people hmm. came from um, UK. Many of them have been testing positive. Yeah. Uh, even in Darwar area, uh, there were some cases yesterday. Today evening we will get to know the update. Um, yesterday there were some 14 people. Pune was the same situation. Some people have yeah, come. Yeah, uh, all the city has this problem because of people going abroad and coming yeah. back. So, so we are having curfew uh, actually in the evening. Uh, uh, okay. uh, yeah. So every day till I think fifth of Jan, we'll be having curfew yeah. from eleven o'clock in the night till six a, six a.m. in the morning. Okay. They import it and suddenly we do. There was a public oh. demand. So they will be imposed it last week only. Then the very next day, they came out with a statement, uh, no, lifted up. So, yeah. But then we will be confined to home even for one more year. Yeah. With all this kind of uh, uncontrolled, uh, you know, spike. And people are careless because the, uh, yeah. Uh, yesterday, day before, I was compelled to attend the marriage. I went with all gear, you know, <laughs> to make sure that nothing happened to me. But I think that nobody was wearing, uh, you know, mask. We had a simple mask in that. So I did not even eat the lunch there. I just came off. Right along. Yeah. And then yeah. No, this is a problem. I mean, uh, people are taking it very lightly, actually. Mm -hmm. So, Professor Mohan has joined us. He uh -huh. is the okay. coordinator of this. Okay, okay. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Hey, good afternoon. How are you? Yeah, things are fine here. Good. So we are now nothing. <laughs> it is actually a sort of a home alternate. Yes. Yes, sir. So love in. And of course, it is a lot of good luck, mm. luck, luck, luck. Yes, sir. We'll wait for the vice chancellor sir, to come. And yes, we sir. still have some time here. Yeah. Okay, okay, no worries. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Ah, good afternoon. Ah, how are you? How are you? I'm fine, waiting. Ah, now you are in the university or? Uh, no, I have no place in the university. I am at home. Okay, okay. I thought this morning was uh, this another session, no? Ah, I had another session. Acha, you had. This local intact people wanted me to. Okay, to okay. Sir, okay. okay. Namaskar, sir. Namaste. Namaste. Sir, are you okay? Yeah, fine, fine. You are fine. What is that? You have good internet, uh, Janazi? Uh, yes, I am a spot on uh, uh, Oh, spot. spot. Okay. Yes, sir. Is it Dio or uh, is it? Uh, is it uh, uh, BSNL? Oh, good. Uh, BSNL in fact. Hello? Ah, okay, hello, good night. Students are joining, asking? 
Yes, we will have circulated amongst all our students. So I hope <laughs> they join in because our turnout every year nowadays is quite high. So oh, we have okay. at least some 50 50 students in both the uh, okay. first and second year. Yeah, but is the lectures have been going on, no? I yes, yes. We are trying to finish. The semester is getting over on the 31st. So um, next month they are having exam somewhere in mid jan mm -hmm. So it's the, it's, everybody is actually trying to finish lectures and teaching. And okay. So I hope, I sincerely hope they join because they have been trying to ask mm -hmm. yeah. everyone to yeah, it is very, very well circulated. I found many first yeah. and groups. No, and nowadays with the younger generation, you know, it's much yeah. faster through social media. Yeah, and they have these um, smartphones and they can Yes, yes. You know, it's not like the old days. Yeah. So for our VC, actually, what happens is uh, he sits on the other side. He sits in the uh -huh. Sanskrit. Uh, Department. Okay. So for his any official meetings and many times, and he has to come to this side. And oh, okay. uh, what happens is he has to take a big long turn in the car. Right? Yeah, yeah. You have to go yeah. to the Sangamvari crossing, and then you have to come back. So there always there are traffic jams. Mm -hmm. it does get a little delayed. He should. He must be on his way. But the classes are also online for the students. Yes, yes, yes. Everything is online. There are no students, excepting some few PhD students, MPhil students are there in the department. But uh, mostly all in at home in different parts. <laughs> right yeah, from yeah. Mizoram to oh, Kerala, you know. Yes, yes. So I, our VC sir has uh, joined Join. us. Okay. Yeah. Good afternoon, Dr. Joshi. Sir, Namaskar. Lectures have been going on for quite some time, no? No, yeah, sir. 
There also you YouTube link also is there, no? Madam, shall we start now at 33 or shall we wait? I think we can start because we shouldn't keep our speakers waiting for long. Yeah, And people I think will join. It takes a little time for people to join. So we will start now. A very good afternoon to you all. As you know that the Deccan College for Graduate and Research Institute, the third oldest the third oldest educational institute of the country is celebrating its bicentenary in the year 2020-2021. As part of this event, the university has decided to celebrate the bicentenary of the institute with a series of extension lectures delivered by eminent scholars in the field of archaeology, linguistics, and sun. The first lecture in this series will be delivered by Professor Ravi Kodisatta. I welcome you all. Now I request our Vice Chancellor, Professor Prasad Joshi, to present the welcome speech. Thank you.
Professor Professor Ravi Kohli Center is an UGC Emeritus Fellow, BC Pathe Chair for Art and Archaeology, Karnataka University, Dharwad. He is a PhD from Deccan College, PGRI, Pune, when it was part of the Pune University. With a specialization in prehistory, he has been actively engaged in carrying out archaeological research in the southern Deccan region, carrying out important excavations such as at the sites of Sannakallu and Jwalapuram. With more than 40 years of research experience along with teaching, he has guided several PhD students, authored many books, and has published widely in both national and international journals. Professor Korisetter has been a visiting fellow to the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, USA, and he's also gone, been a, a visiting a lecturer at Cambridge University, UK. Professor Koresetta has served as a member of professional bodies such as the UGC, IPA, ISPQS, INQUA, etc. Recently, he has helped in setting up the Archaeology Museum at Bellary in Karnataka. He is one of the editors of the Current Science, India's leading fortnightly science journal. On this occasion, may I now request Professor Koresetta to deliver his talk on the archaeology at Sanganakal. Thank you, Dr. Gurchi and uh, Dr. Arti for inviting me and uh, introducing me also. I'm currently a senior academic fellow of the ICHR and uh, retired from Karnataka University seven years ago. I'm particularly so happy and feel proud as an alumnus of Deccan College that I was considered 
um, to deliver this uh, first lecture in this series uh, to celebrate this bicentenary um, of Deccan College. And I'm very particularly happy that many of my <coughs> former colleagues and uh, you know my class fellows are also part of this event that's going on at Deccan College. And I'm very, very happy to also share some of my personal experiences here before I uh, embark on presenting my talk. Uh, I came to Deccan College a year after the uh, sexual centennial celebrations. That is, the 150 years of Deccan College was celebrated in 1971. I got myself admitted for my PG degree in archaeology in 1972. And I came in, uh, many of my senior batch uh, you know, friends were remembering the event that took place on the, uh, the cricket ground, it used to be earlier. Now it has been converted into some, uh, you know, uh, place where events take place. Uh, <coughs> so that uh, Pro President Vivigiri at that time was uh, the chief guest I was told. And I'm very happy uh, that uh, I have been in this field uh, since then and almost 50 years now. And uh, by the end of uh, next, uh, ne next, next year, perhaps, by October, uh, Deccan College will be completing 200 years of its service to the uh, nation. So I'm so happy to be part of this program. And uh, should I show, share my this thing, uh, screen? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay, so the topic as I have been, uh, uh, as I have been wanting to talk is Archaeology of Sanganakalu. Why I selected this topic? There are three or four reasons. Uh, the first and foremost is Sanganakalu happens to be uh, a site, archaeological site, attended for well over 300 years, beginning from about the early part of the 19th century to till now. And there have been uh, phases of investigation going on at uh, Sanganakalu during um, this time period and each time um, we have come back with a newer understanding of uh, the archaeological context preserved in the uh, archaeological site of Sanganakalu and so on. And it is also a site <coughs> which laid the foundations of uh, Neolithic archaeology in peninsular South India because the discovery of this site goes back to 1870. But, uh, until about 1942, it was generally thought, um, uh, and until about 1842, it was generally thought the Neolithic archaeology of uh, peninsular South India um, began by the discovery of, uh, you know, <coughs> a bag full of uh, stone flakes in the courtyard of one Dr. Primrose in the Raichu district uh, near Lingasugur. But later on, we came to know uh, that uh, the site of, uh, um, you know, Kurakni. Uh, and series of other sites uh, in and around Sanganakalu were discovered in the early part of the 19th century and the credit goes to the, uh, the first survey general of India uh, that is Colin Mackenzie uh, who was uh, an antiquarian as well. Uh, he was the first person to discover some of these mounds which are now well known in archaeological literature as ash mounds. And uh, uh, although he was uh, not in a position to identify what these features are, but they were certain about the fact that these are not natural mounds, and, and, and they also have, in, in terms of their size, they have proportions of a hill or so. And one of these ash mounds, uh, first uh, uh, in the valley, which is also known as Budi Kanama Path uh, in the Karnataka, Bellari region, is Budi Kanama, is the Budi means ash, Kanama means valley. It is a passage linking uh, the city of Bellari with the city of Phosphate in that region. But there are series of such mounds uh, you know, occurring in the neighborhood of this particular mound, which is called Kudutini Ash Mound now. Um, and also ash mounds are found at the site of Sangamakalu as well. Uh, we can see two broad phases uh, in the way in which, uh, you know, uh, investigations into the archaeology of this region began. Uh, with the first discovery of uh, these ash mounds, uh, we can uh, uh, 
uh, we can identify this phase as pre-identification phase, wherein Colin McKenzie and DJ Newborn played an important role because clues about the existence of such mounds in the Bellary region or in the neighborhood of Sanganakalu were uh, informed uh, to DJ Newbold, who was a geologist and antiquarian, and he was serving the Madras Regiment. Uh, while he was posted in Karnul, uh, he took time off to, you know, survey um, uh, the interior areas uh, and he discovered the famous caves of uh, caves of Bila Sarda, and also uh, visited um, uh, the site of uh, ash mound at Kudithinia. And in addition, he also discovered the ash mounds near Sanganakalu as well. The third important reason why I took up this topic was Deccan College has played an important role in establishing the archaeological profile of this particular site called Sanganakalu. The fourth reason is, I will come back to that point as we go through this presentation, and these ash mounds, I am using the term ash mound, uh, is the deliberate accumulation of cacted dung, sometimes on a rugged land surface and sometimes on made grounds or leveled grounds. Or, for example, this ash mound that we see here um, is, uh, is, uh, um, is based on a, a gravel platform. Uh, it has been described as a Muram platform, but we have also examined uh, the base of this particular ash mound. This is the largest ash mound that we know of uh, in any part of uh, the northern Karnataka region, which is now known as Kalyana Karnataka, right from Beera in the north. Uh, to Chitradurga uh, and Anantapur, Karnul, Bellari, Raichur, Bijapur, and uh, Belgam districts, and so on. Uh, there have been several hundred uh, ash mounds which have been known uh, during the course of time, ever since they were first discovered. But when Colin McKenzie uh, um, uh, visited this particular site, he was not aware of its uh, archaeological significance. So also uh, Thomas Newbold. Uh, but uh, Newbold went a step further. Uh, in, in addition to visiting this site, which is um, uh, at Kudithini, uh, he also visited uh, several other um, areas in the neighborhood of Kudithini, and Sanganakalu happens to be in the neighborhood of this particular site called Kudithini. This accumulated cow uh, dung was set on fire periodically, and we see the profile of this particular ash mound, uh, you know, a, strati a stratification, or we see a series of layers. Um, indicating uh, layers where the accumulated cow dung, cow dung was burnt at very, very high temperatures. Uh, there are layers where the soft ash layers are still, uh, you know, uh, in, in semi-burnt condition. And then we have sometimes gravel bodies, sometimes soil layers, and then again vitrified uh, horizons and so on. The vitrification of uh, uh, this particular ash has, um, has, has been seen in several uh, uh, layers in this pattern, and this, this vitrification occurs when silica gets dissolved, you know, gets fused into this, you uh, know, uh, cow dung set on fire up to about 1200 degrees centigrade or so. So that vitrified ash, uh, uh, you know, is, has given a permanent uh, uh, existence to these ash mounds. If they were simple loose, um, you know, ash deposits, they would have been eroded away and things like that. So they uh, stand, uh, you know, abruptly, uh, very prominently on the landscape. They can be identified uh, from a distance. And there are some of these ash mounds which are, um, you know, within the valley, uh, within the valleys at the base of large hills and so on. So uh, until uh, Robert Bruceford and B. Subarao came onto the scene, uh, we were not aware of the archaeological significance of these uh, ash mounds. But anyway, uh, given the uh, uh, information that we have uh, since the time of uh, Thomas Newbold and his first, uh, you know, scientific approach to understanding these deposits, because he was very, very sure they are not natural, and so he dug at a couple of uh, ash mounds he had discovered near Sanganakalu and sent samples to the Asiatic Society in Kolkata and also Madras Literary Society um, in Chennai. And both of them gave uh, reports, uh, you know, and those were the days when they were not uh, sus suspecting um, this to be uh, an accumulated car dung which was set on fire. But then when uh, uh, these similar simple experiments began to be conducted, uh, several suggestions came from people who were examining this deposit. And uh, Thomas Newbold published a couple of articles based on uh, the findings that were uh, given to him by the uh, Calcutta um, 
uh, Asiatic society and the Adros Literary Society. Some people called it volcanic scoria, and some people called it it is limestone slag. Some people called it it is uh, you know a travel train formed by calcareous springs and so on. And then uh, some people even went uh, to the extent of you know identifying these mounds as uh, cremation grounds or uh, sati. Uh, you know, commit, commitment of uh, sati by medieval uh, women, and then also uh, the presence of this vitrified horizon and slag-like material uh, around the mounds also uh, gave uh, gave some uh, idea to uh, some of these pioneers to suggest that this was perhaps slag manufacturing area and metallurgical slag. Uh, people like Yazdani, people like Leonard Munn, and uh, so those people thought that this. For such high temperature uh, burning condition, uh, perhaps were you know they uh, were uh, helping in in producing you know glass that is weak, uh, and then also extracting uh, copper and then iron and so on and so forth. And this hill range that we see is also known as Copper Mountain. And then the entire range is rich in variety of uh, you know of uh, crystal and silica materials, you know, variety of uh, semi precious stones like. Uh, carnelian, jasper, and so on and so forth, which later we come across several instances where these raw materials were procured for developing, uh, you know, um, <coughs> wheat, lapidary, and so on. But at some point, with the coming of Robert Brucefoot onto the scene, uh, for the first time, uh, he was the one who identified their direct association with the Neolithic agro pastoral way of life. And then uh, this, this is the result of deliberate accumulation of cow dung, and he drew some parallels from African uh, context, and then suggested that this is a burnt cow dung, and uh, um, in associated with the cattle keepers and so on and so forth. Later on, it was uh, uh, a designer uh, who came onto the scene uh, in the post-independence period, and he examined these deposits, visited these ash mounds in number of places. And also carried out detailed petrological, chemical, and uh, you know, and other uh, you know experiments. Burning uh, cow dung experiments were also conducted, and he was very sure that food observations were correct. And then it was no doubt that this is a cattle a cattle dung accumulated and burnt on occasions. But Foot was also the first person who suggested that this was perhaps associated with some ritual. Uh, activities performed by the Neolithic people in this region and so on. So since I said more than uh, two, two centuries or more than two and a half centuries of research has been going on on the Neolithic of southern India uh, and also uh, with Sanganakal at its focus, I uh, just want to uh, give an idea to some of the students who are participating in this program that how this, uh, you know, uh, research on the Neolithic of southern India and also Archaeology of the Sanganakalu Neolithic site has progressed uh, since beginning. Uh, with the work of uh, Newbold, following the work of Newbold and his, his publications, what we see the next major publication came from Robert Brucefoot, whom we regard as father of Indian tree history, and he was also the pioneer um, of, in the Neolithic archaeology of the uh, you know the Sanganakalu site as well as the related sites uh, in the in neighborhood of Sanganakalu. And he is also credited for the discovery of a large number of Neolithic sites, megalithic sites, ash mound sites uh, in Bellary, Raichur, Karnul, Anantapur districts, and so on. Um, as far as I know, uh, in the neighborhood of Sanganakalu, he himself has you know, documented more than 160 sites. Uh, but his observations on Sanganakalu is a landmark uh, you know, document that we have which he published in one of the memoirs uh, of the Geological Survey of India relating to the geology of Bellary region, where he described this Sanganakalu site as one of the largest Neolithic stone axe manufacturing center, and also went into the aspects of pro provenancing uh, <coughs> the source of raw materials which were used by these people. In addition to use of local granite and dolerite and gabbro and such other materials, he found variety of these which were made from exotic raw materials which are not part of the uh, geological formations in the, at, at Sanganakallu and so on. So that is a major paper which he described as economic prehistory, uh, uh, has been an inspiration to many later archaeologists to look into, you know, um, archaeological um, uh, components of this particular uh, 
Neolithic site, not only Sanganakalu and elsewhere in the neighborhood. So in 19, 1873, 1870 was the first visit of Robert Bruce Wood to the Larry region. And then by that time, uh, because of uh, <coughs> the information uh, given to him by one William Fraser, who was a district civil engineer, uh, he visited the site of uh, Sanganakalu. And uh, Sanganakalu is the region. A, an area where we have five uh, insel birds, on top of which we have, at that point of time, when foot visited, these uh, archaeological vestiges were found on top of uh, plateau surfaces of these hills, and that is where he found a dense scatter of waste products of stone axe manufacturing activity. And then uh, he made uh, additional, very meticulous observations and gave a beautiful description of the characteristic features of uh, the cultural uh, context of this particular site. So these are some of his publications which uh, take us through the history of archaeological research on the Neolithic site of Sanganakalu. And then as I mentioned, the geology of Bellari district has that particular chapter called um, Economic Prehistory, where he was very, very successful in tracing the source of variety of exotic raw materials which he found scattered on the surface of the plateau of uh, the large hill. At that point of time, this large hill at Sanganakalu was known as Kupugal. And our capital, because a huge dolerite dike cuts through this large hill and then it occupies the major portion of the summit of this hill and it is black in color. And so the hill came to be known as Kapagal. And also the village in the neighborhood of this hill is also known as Kapagal and so on. And uh, <coughs> so the two major rock formations that we see at Sanganikalu is granite and its variants, then the dolerite dike, and then dense scatter of quartz shingles. Uh, which were a uh, source of uh, you know, raw material for making quartz microliths and so on. Uh, we do not have, uh, the, the, the Neolithic folk did not have access to cryptocrystalline silica like chalcedony, like jasper, and, uh, <coughs> um, you know, church, church rock and so on. So that is where the idea of, uh, you know, sourcing the raw materials which were uh, utilized by the, 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 the settlers of Sanganakalu uh, became an important topic for Robert Brucewood. And then subsequently, um, this large hill also came to be identified as a Neolithic rock art site. And normally the credit was given to Fawcett, uh, who is also the well-known discoverer of the site of uh, Edakal um, in Kerala, in Vayanad. Uh, he was the first person to visit this site of Sanganakallu. And the Dolodite Dike is the, a major locus of, of rock art uh, of the Neolithic period, Neolithic and Iron Age period and so on. But before uh, uh, Parsett himself uh, published a small paper uh, in the Asiatic Quarterly, it was Robert Stevel who was a district administra administrator and also well known for his account on the Vijayanagara Empire. He was the first person to um, publish on uh, the rock art of the Sanganakalu uh, region. And so he was followed by Parsett. And then uh, we have Robert Stevel uh, talking about the ash mounds as well. Um, because all these were very, uh, you know, important, uh, you know, components of the landscape in and around Bellary, the major granitic, uh, you know, raw, tar interval landscapes and so on. In the early 20th century, we have A. H. Longhurst on behalf of um, the Archaeological Survey of India. He also visited some of these ash mounds, and Kudithini perhaps was one thing, one place like Mecca for all these early um, antiquarians, and then he came out with his own. Uh, understanding of uh, uh, these uh, cinder mounds as the places where uh, cremations took place, as places where the satis were performed and so on. But in, 19, in 1916, when uh, Food published his uh, catalog, uh, you know, <coughs> very detailed information about the various sites, uh, Neolithic and earlier, and also Iron Age sites were, uh, you know, described in his catalog, and this uh, became the, uh, you know, sort of a guide for later archaeologists. At this point of time, we should remember the contribution of Professor Sankalia, who, read, who was a thorough, uh, first, perhaps first serious student of Robert Bruce's catalogs, and then uh, he made notes to, you know, uh, you know, identify potential areas for conducting archaeological research. Until Dr. Sankalia came onto the scene, um, all these archaeological sites were attended to by various variety of scholars, excluding archaeologists. So when Sankalia identified uh, the potential of this region, he also identified the late B. Subaru uh, to retrace the footsteps of Robert Bruce Foot uh, in the Bellary region, and then that became part of his uh, 
know, what we call PhD dissertation. At that time, Deccan College was part of the uh, Mumbai University. And so Subrao uh, resurveyed uh, in, a, in a way, very, very successfully retraced the footsteps of Robert Bruce Wood and added many more sites uh, to the list which was already uh, you know, published by Robert Bruce Wood. And in addition to that, when he came to the Bellary region, there were three or four motivating factors behind it. One was Robert Bruce Wood's catalogs themselves, another was Professor Pankalia's advice, and then the third one was, um, you know, the site of Brahmagiri was excavated by Wheeler in the 1940s and had developed a, a culture history model or what we call vertical, um, you know, uh, excavation method was standardized for the Brahmagiri where he had, uh, you know, delineated the succession of cultures from the early phase, Neolithic, middle phase, Iron Age and the late phase, early historic and so on. And this excavation had a problem uh, that was addressed to by uh, Mortimer Wheeler that is the chronology of South India and then he wanted to uh, find out the relationship between these habitation sites and the megalithic complexes. And when he excavated Brahmagiri, he found that the black and red were um, in the Iron Age levels, in the habitation area, and black and red were um, ceramics in the megalithic burials. And that is how it could be established very clearly, the megalith uh, and uh, black and red were meal thrown, uh, you know, uh, pottery or uh, coeval, and then that marked the Iron Age, uh, you know, time period in the proto history of uh, peninsular South India and so on. So this model was also a motivating factor for P. Subarao and above all, uh, he was ahead of his time at that point of time. And so he excavated on uh, one of the hills at uh, uh, Sanganakallu and that uh, hill is known as uh, Sanarachama, but unfortunately in his publications it is misspelled as Sanarachama. Whatever it is, he had two trenches on the plateau surface of the Sanarachama hill and then he came out with a cultural stratigraphy uh, um, uh, similar to the one which was uh, published by uh, Wheeler, but the succession of cultural levels were different from what Wheeler had uh, documented at Sanganakalu. At the base, he found uh, um, a, a ceramic Neolithic characterized by the patinated flakes and the quartz industry, uh, and then succeeded by Neolithic stone axes with the handmade pottery and so on. And then above this particular level, he identified megalithic period. Unlike at Brahmagiri, um, this site did not uh, uh, have yield any evidence for the early historic phase and so on. So that is why he identified, uh, you know, uh, the Neolithic settlement on top of this, and also to make, make suggestions about the pre-Neolithic phase in this particular area. Following uh, the work of uh, <coughs> uh, Superau, uh, we do have. Uh, Scholars like D.S. Gordon, um, Raymond Alchin, and Jainer, and uh, Professor Sankali again uh, visiting the site uh, from time to time. Gordon focused, uh, Gordon in the company of uh, Raymond Alchin, uh, you know, uh, documented rock art in this area. Uh, that is with reference to the rock art sites on the large field that I will gradually show you. And then, of course, as I mentioned, Jainer was interested in understanding, um, you know, the intricacies of identifying the ash and its mode of formation and the physical and chemical properties including petrology, um, you know, phosphate chemistry to identify whether it is a burnt powder or anything else, whether it is associated with some industrial activity or not. And then in 1960s, when Sekalokota was uh, discovered by M.S. Nagaraj Rao, Professor Sankalia was directing uh, these excavations at Sekalokota at the same time, they also kind of reopened some of the trenches which were dug by B. Subarao. And when Subarao had dug only two trenches, uh, Ansari, Jedi Ansari and M.S. Nagaraj Rao dug nearly seven uh, trenches on the same hill where Subarao had excavated. And then, uh, in addition to what um, you know, Subarao had documented, these people also found evidence for pre Mesolithic, pre Mesolithic, um, you know. Uh, flake tool industry with some evidence for, uh, you know, what we call um, middle phallolithic kind of, uh, you know, technology reflected in some of these flake, flake assemblages found below the Mesolithic levels on the hill, but they did not find any evidence for uh, what is called uh, a ceramic Neolithic. But in addition, they also found um, ashy layers in the stratigraphy. 
Uh, but these uh, trenches dug by Ansari and Nagaraja Rao were not continuous, they were random. Uh, so, uh, the, the, despite the fact that they, there was an ash layer comparable to the ash deposits seen at the, some of the ash mounds, they were not sure of uh, you know, establishing the presence of an ash mound or so. Uh, this was the case even in uh, Brahmagiri. Uh, but then they suggested the possibility of an ash mound on top of the hill and so on. Uh, but they were not in a position to, uh, you know, uh, expose the ash mound and, uh, you know, document its dimensions and so on. Uh, but then he, they found uh, uh, three distinctive phases. Phase one is patinated place with microlase quartz and chert uh, as a three neolithic kind of situation. And then in phase two they found stone axes, flakes, microlase, and then you have handmade pale grey ware and then sometimes uh, grey, uh, uh, and a pale brown ware and so on. And then the subface uh, in phase two was also uh, characterized by the presence of coarse brown ware and black ware and then of course along with the Neolithic stone axes and then uh, flake tools and uh, such other material as well there. And phase three, um, like Subarao had identified, it was, uh, you know, a polished, well polished black and red ware of the Iron Age and so on and so forth. Uh, at the same time, uh, the, the, uh, the problem of identifying the pre-neolithic phase at Sanganakalu had also uh, bothered, uh, uh, you know, uh, Professor Sankalia, uh, even uh, Antari and Nagarajara as well. And Professor Sankalia also excavated in the plains around the hill here, and he also found, uh, uh, you know, similar evidence, and then he tried to uh, substantiate uh, the documentations of uh, earlier workers. Uh, like Subarao, Ansari, and uh, Nagarajarao, and so on. So na the contribution of uh, uh, Nagarajarao and Ansari being that uh, a pre pre Mesolithic, uh, what we call core tool assemblage, found in the stratigraphy. Because um, you know, if you have to uh, have a clear idea of the cultural uh, association and the way in which they develop vertically, we need to have even in such sites like uh, you know Neolithic sites, we need to have horizontal excavations, then only we will be very clear uh, about the spatial extent of various features which are observed in one small trend. And so these, these problems continue to bother archaeologists who came there from time to time. In the 70s, what we see, there was a major project, uh, you know, directed by Professor R. V. Joshi, uh, and that was chemical analysis of archaeological soil, where fluorine phosphate uh, analysis, nitrogen fluorine analysis of uh, um, you know, the soils associated with uh, human activity and then different activity areas in a given settlement could be distinguished or discriminated based on uh, the fluorine phosphate ratios and nitrogen fluorine ratios and so on. So as part of uh, this particular project, two PhD dissertations were produced at Tekken College. One was by Mrs. Uh, uh, Anupama Shreesagar and another was by Dr. B. C. Devtare. Dissertations, they do have reference to the analysis of fluorine phosphate and then uh, nitrogen fluorine uh, phosphate, you know, analysis of animal bones were also included into their, uh, you know, uh, dissertations. And then following this work, uh, again in 1995, Alchin and Alchin, both of them who are known for uh, having carried out, you know, extensive research on the Neolithic of the northern part of the Bellary region, uh, also visited uh, the large hill at Sanganakalu and then they made a fresh study of the rock art in that region and so on. And then in the 1990s, uh, I am particularly happy as an alumnus of Deccan College, I also initiated a new project because all these investigations that I was mentioning till now, they were only describing uh, the stratigraphical development, they were describing uh, you know, the material cultural characteristics and so on. But we know that these were Neolithic, uh, you know, uh, settlements and we did not have much information about, you know, what type of uh, food crops were cultivated, what different types of animals were domesticated, and uh, what is the spatial and temporal development in these bioarchaeological um, aspects of the Neolithic uh, community who, who lived, um, you know, uh, very successfully for well over 2000 years in this particular landscape and so on. So the lack of this information was to be filled up, and so I initiated a project with the collaboration of Dr. D.K. Chakravarti and Martin Jones of Cambridge University, and then one of their students were uh, you know, advised to work with me in India as a learn term uh, guide. I facilitated his work, and during this time, 
we initiated uh, you know survey of all the all the well known neolithic sites and then we visited uh, nearly 45 to 50 sites between the eastern ghats and western ghats at various stages of preservation uh, in other words at various stages of uh, destruction and then when we landed at deccan college uh, so, sorry when we landed at sanganakalu uh, the story was very very different and this work um, ultimately uh, produced excellent results and we were able to make a claim for uh, the southern neolithic as an independent center of agricultural origins because until then it was thought that agriculture in southern neolithic is a late starter and it, it resulted uh, the result of uh, you know influence from the northern deccan calcolithic cultures and so on but here it was possible on the basis of the work carried out by dk fuller uh, it was possible to identify this region as an independent center based on millet and pulse agriculture domestically. Uh, and then uh, following this particular phase of uh, initiation, we have been visiting the site uh, until now, almost 25 years, and continue to be visiting the site. Each time we go, we have gone, we have come back with a new observation, new documentation and so on. So I see there is a lot of potential for future research at this site. It is one of the largest sites anywhere in South India. And uh, uh, another paper towards the end of our project was spread over seven years or so. We came out with this uh, radiocarbon uh, chronology for the Neolithic culture of the southern uh, peninsula, South Deccan, Neolithic archaeology and so on. There are a large number of papers published between 1999 and 2007 and even later. But uh, for want of time, I'm not mentioning all that. And the fourth reason why I came to De Sanganakalu was this particular situation. So the sites are at various stages of discussion, uh, destruction. And as you all know, most prehistoric sites are buried in the landscape. They are not visible to the naked eye. So unless somebody has, someone has a trained eye to identify these features, we will not uh, come to know that there is an archaeological context in the landscape uh, and so on. So when we, uh, during the course of our um, you know, project with Dorian Fuller, when we came here, this was the state of affairs. And what could be done because this is the largest site and then initial explorations we were able to collect or grab samples from all cut sections uh, exposed along the site and on the plateau and so on because the land spent uh, digging activity and then dynamite uh, you know blasting activity was going on so we had two important aims in mind grab as many samples as one can so that we can produce some preliminary results and then try to proceed with the district administration to make sure that the site is preserved because as we know the history of archaeological investigations have given us uh, you know uh, a good idea of the spatial extent of this particular site and every inch of this land uh, has some information about our past um, you know late, late late holocene time period or even earlier uh, but the point here is that the preserve protection of the site for further destruction as i said even now, when we go back, we come back with some new observations, new documentation, and new insights into the site, and so on. So these two ends uh, finally uh, yielded results, and then we were able to stop uh, you know, this kind of damage that was going on, and then launch a systematic investigation, multidisciplinary investigations, and so on. So here, first and foremost requirement, I have already briefly told you, uh, about these early excavation, early explorations, which uh, you know identified the site as a Neolithic site, whether it is rock art, whether it is uh, you know Neolithic um, um, you know stone axe manufacturing activity, or whether it is um, you know the cultural succession um, as reflected in the excavations of the Subarau and so on. Um, this Subarau initially did uh, surface survey and then identified the Sanvachama hill and then he dug two trenches there, and following that. Uh, he published his uh, findings in 1948, and then Professor Sanclias worked at the Bangal Tota on uh, previous pre, pre Neolithic, uh, uh, you know, industry, and then Rao and Ansari's publication on their work, uh, uh, Sanaracha Mahil, and so on. So there are so many other sites like Kupkal Ashmont. During the time when uh, Ansari, Rao, and Professor Sanclias were working, it was Majumdar and Rajguru who initiated. Uh, uh, excavation at one of the ash ponds at the base of uh, the Sanganakali hill and then Professor Sankalia excavated uh, the microliths on the plains. Uh, but then when uh, we realized that the site is likely to be destroyed but we were not sure whether the authorities, uh, local authorities will help us uh, you know, uh, stop the mining activity. 
what we thought of was prepare this total station map and then uh, put in each and every archaeological feature on the landscape. We realize that it extends for more than uh, 1,200 1, acres of land. And then we were able to identify distinctive activity areas uh, at various points on the landscape. Uh, this is the large hill, which was known as Kuptal Hill. It is also known as Peacock Hill. It is also known as Large Hill, the Hiregoda, Kuptal, and so on. Uh, what is important for us here is um, this is the dike which cuts through the cuts through the entire hill, and this was the major source of raw material for making ground stone axes and so on. So such outcrops of dolerite are not seen on the other hills. Uh, this is the site where uh, Subrao had excavated in the 1940s. And other hills also preserve evidence of activity of the same time period. So, uh, it, what was uh, what was um, the benefit of preparing this map was we were now in a position to integrate all cultural features, you know, across this landscape, and then uh, you know uh, bring them to kind of a system and a wherein we can we are we are we will be in a position to understand the relationship between various activity areas and the way in which the site, uh, you know, uh, developed over a time period because we were now able to establish a radiocarbon chronology for various, uh, you know, cultural periods uh, that were, um, you know, previously documented and on freshly dug areas were also uh, yielding very suitable uh, materials for rating by, um, you know, AMS radiocarbon dating. Plenty of information we could be uh, recovered um, in, uh, in, in, in terms of bioarchaeological remains, you know, uh, plant remains, uh, animal bones, and even enter into, um, you know, <coughs> the areas of uh, preservation of uh, you know, phytolates and also uh, parenchyma tissues and so on, and then understand uh, the, the, the presence of these ash bones um, at different points along the landscape. So initially, when food and uh, when uh, New World came, he had documented only two of these ash mounds. When food came, he added one more. And then when our team started working, we have added four more. In all, there are um, seven ash mounds at different points along the uh, landscape, at the base of the hill, on the shoulder of the hill, and then on the plateau itself, on Sanarachama, as well as on this large hill and so on. So these are some of the features which you have seen. Uh, and then these quarried pits refer to the mining of dolerite during the Neolithic times, and these uh, circle, full circles, which are, uh, you know, they represent intact ash ponds in one or two places. This is partially preserved, and this is completely destroyed, and so on. And then you have evidence for Neolithic habitation areas, and then you have uh, areas where you have, uh, um, you know, these Neolithic axe workshops, and so on. So this widespread occurrence of uh, the Neolithic uh, uh, in this area is perhaps the largest anywhere in southern India. And if you move uh, in any direction, radiate in any direction, every two or three kilometers you have a Neolithic uh, context. But the density and intensity of uh, you know, Neolithic activity uh, is, uh, is not reflected at any other site but the Sanganakalu site. Uh, so why Sanganakalu is another reason, because the previous workers, especially Nagaraj Rao and Ansari's work, had uh, revealed the presence of, uh, you know, house floors, post holes, and then, uh, you know, hearts and so on, and then, then some structures, uh, and then he had found series of, uh, uh, series of levels reflecting upon occupational uh, levels, and then uh, the rock art, uh, in addition to the rock bruisings of the Neolithic, even paintings were identified. Uh, during the 1960s, and then we uh, we also have these kind of bedrock features on top of the hill and at uh, various points wherever we have this outcrop uh, exposed. Even on the pediment surfaces, wherever you have this granitic bedrock, you do have these features, which we call them uh, what we call um, bedrock mortars. These are concave hollows. They were meant for processing grains as well as pro you know polishing the stone axes. So uh, you know, high sen high very sensitive. Um, uh, photo micro photography has helped us identify textural variation in the way in which uh, these areas were subject to grinding and processing, uh, you know, um, uh, processing grains. And the textural variation was very, very clear to indicate that some of them were meant for polishing and some of them were meant for, um, you know, processing grains and so on. So these boulders, we call them tar, and uh, we have this rock shelter, um, you know, you know, surrounded by dense scatter of what we call quartz shingles, 
and these are pebbles, water worn pebbles, which were part and parcel of landscape evolution here. Um, and these quartz uh, shingles or pebbles were ideal uh, for producing microliths. And so this rock shelter was meant for producing uh, um, microliths of quartz and so on. And the surface of uh, the, the hilltop as well as at the base, uh, we find some of these blocks, um, you know, pebbles and cobbles of dolerite, um, you know, discarded. Um, you know, which were not found suitable for further modification uh, into axis and so on. And we also find, in addition to that, even on the plateau, as well as in the, in the, in the uh, you know, pediment surfaces, variety of these megalithic uh, burial monuments. So, uh, in, in this area, we have a large number of these uh, megalithic burials, stone circles, menhirs, and so on. Unfortunately, uh, before we landed at Sanganakalu, many of them were destroyed and uh, this, uh, villagers have enclosed and so on. But then the density of uh, megalithic structures, which we know from Foods account and uh, you know, the accounts of 1960s, uh, makes us very clear that this was a site which was um, uh, intensely uh, occupied during the time period from uh, the second uh, half of the third millennium to uh, the beginning of the first millennium and so on. Uh, in addition to that, Poot had recorded the presence of uh, this kind of uh, beads um, on the surface, on the plateau, uh, surface of the large hill, and then he found that none of the raw materials used for making such beads occur in the granitic hills. So he wrote that paper on economic history where he was able to successfully trace the source of these the carnelian, jasper, steatite, agate, and so on and so forth, and the existence of lapidary as early as the uh, Neolithic time period was, uh, uh, you know, fully substantiated by even later workers. And during the course of our investigations also, we have been able to uh, recover the presence of uh, beads of these various uh, kinds. And then in addition to that, we have well-finished and uh, unfinished and also debitage resulting from stone axe manufacturing activity, littering the entire plateau surface. Uh, uh, in the next slide, I will show you the, how thick is the debitage, uh, you know, covering the plateau surface there. And then we have these varieties of uh, handmade pottery um, in the early phase of the Neolithic and then uh, uh, occasionally in the later phases of the Neolithic levels we come across the use of copper and occasionally evidence for precious metal and so on. So this black and red ware which was noticed uh, first by Subarov at uh, Sanganakallo uh, on Sandarachamma Hill uh, occurs at all the Neolithic uh, you know, um, <coughs> sites in the area which was uh, subject to investigation during the last 15 to 20 years or so. This is wheel-made bichrome pottery associated with the Iron Age, early Iron Age in this area. And we, in, along with this pottery, we do come across the presence of these uh, Neolithic, uh, you know, sorry, megalithic burials as well. Uh, no, no evidence for iron in the early stages, so we have identified pre-Iron Iron Age in this context, as well as, um, you know, iron, uh, proper Iron Age a little later, around 1000 BC or so. So, uh, as I mentioned, that uh, you know, because of the ongoing destruction during the 90s, many of the ash mounds which were um, at different at different points along the hill were also were destroyed. And this is that remnant of a vitrified um, ash surviving on top of this hill called Chardamagoda. So that is where we were able to identify ash mounds on top of the hill. And then these ash mounds are a substratum of the later Neolithic deposits associated with the establishment of the village. I was talking about the dolerite dike, and some of these pits very clearly show the ancient mine pits from where the blocks of dolerite were procured, and they were subject to modification. And the waste products I'm referring to uh, frequently, uh, they are found on the plateau surface, and sometimes one meter to one and a half meter thick flake deposits. These flakes occur in Sanarachama, these flakes uh, debitage occurs at the base of the hill and also on the plateau surface. Um, well marked workshop areas have also been found. So this mapping uh, through total station documentation helps us identify the relationship between, uh, you know, the, the, the kind of uh, deposits that we see associated with Stone Axe Manufacturing Center. It was not only the hilltop, uh, you know, the plateau of the large hill which was a stone axe manufacturing center. Raw material was procured from here and transported to other hilltop settlements and they were also modified into various types of neolithic axes and so on. Because these bedrock potters are also seen on all the hilltops and also at the base of the hill. 
So, for example, this is at the base of the hill associated with some, you know, small vein of dolerite dike running very near and this dolerite dike was utilized for producing, uh, procuring uh, blocks of this uh, dolerite and then modify them and these grooves are the places where the edges of these axes were sharpened. So, they still remain. You, 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 have, you can see the presence of these, uh, you know, what so-called patinated flakes occurring below the Neolithic levels on Sandarachama or uh, the presence of microliths, you know, uh, in the Bangal Kota area could be related to the activities that were going on at the Neolithic time itself. Uh, this is the kind of uh, inference we have drawn based on uh, in, uh, integrating the evidence uh, spread over a vast landscape area. So this is the site where we find quartz shingles scattered and then um, they were used for producing the microliths. And this scatter is found uh, all along the foothill area and uh, this particular shelter was one center where the intensity of uh, you know microlithic manufacturing light activity was very very high and then uh, we were wondering uh, and of course archaeologists have been wondering right from the beginning why the settlements are situated on tops of uh, these granitic hills if you look at the landscape these hills are called residual hills these hills are called uh, inselbergs so inselbergs are those uh, you know, residual granitic, uh, you know, um, masses surrounded by vast, uh, you know, plains. It is a pediment, a um, Piedmont pediment, and if you stretch this uh, plain area, uh, it runs into hundreds of kilometers as a plenty plain. So this is a tar inserted, uh, you know, uh, landscape, uh, popularly known as uh, the Maidan region, and this is not an area where we have an organized drainage network. And none of these Neolithic sites are associated with the network of drainage. Uh, you know, we have uh, seasonal streams, we have a uh, you know, series of uh, uh, low order streams flowing and they are all seasonal and ephemeral and they don't carry water beyond the monsoon season. So in such a situation, why these settlements were situated on tops of uh, these granitic hills? And then why do we have these granitic soils or calcareous, you know, uh, grey soils? But suddenly, you know, across the landscape, you come across these patches of black soil here and there. So we were wondering about explaining why the sites are situated, where they are. And then when we went into the, the details of geological relationship between various, uh, you know, um, litter units that we encountered in the granitic hills, the relationship between granite and the dike uh, was creating a kind of an obstruction to the flow of groundwater. Now, unlike the surface flow of water, which uh, drains from higher level to lower level, what we learned is that groundwater flows from lower level to higher level. So, when you have a granite intruded by granite uh, dolerite, you know that actually obstructs the flow of groundwater, and then the intrusion, intrusive relationship between uh, in the granite and the dolerite has given rise to formation of series of fissures and cracks and so on and so forth. And uh, with the obstruction of the groundwater flow, water tables were on the increase and they were finding their outlet through these uh, fissures and uh, fractures. And that spring activity emanating from all around the hillside was gradually flowing down. And then if you follow very carefully the, uh, the, 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 the sediments uh, at the base of the hill and the sediments away from the hill, what we see is it is in-situ weathering of granite. And then when you come closer to the foothill of the hill, uh, you know, foothills, what you see is uh, well-rounded granite granules, you know, and when you go away from this, you get you get to see, um, you know, angular uh, granules of granite and so on. But suddenly, you also encounter these black soil patches. So, these are the places, these were topographic lows, uh, which facilitated accumulation of uh, spring water draining from the hillside, and then they provided perennial source of water ponds, uh, you know, a swampy condition, uh, pools and ponds facilitating, you know, uh, water buffaloes and then also facilitating agricultural activity and so on. And the sides of the hills were uh, draining down very, very gently and water used to flow down in sheets, not in the form of channeled water courses. And that is why we have these planation surfaces here. And then these black soils represent ancient pools and ponds. Because of modification of the landscape during the last several hundred years or even more, uh, we do not have a clear idea uh, from uh, general observation about the paleogeography, unless you enter into uh, the issues of understanding various depositions, depositional features that we come across at the base of the hill and then away from the hill and then the occurrence of ponded place and so on, gave us clues to the fact 
that these hilltops were most preferred because of perennial spring activity and the geological uh, formations and their interrelationship facilitated the availability of uh, you know, perennial source of water which was draining down and accumulating in the form of pools and ponds. Only in the post-Neolithic times, landscapes came to be modified and that modification uh, restricted the movement of water in the form of sheep and uh, this water began to flow in the form of in the narrow track and gradually cutting down and then the shallow stream network that we see here is a result of post-Neolithic modification of the land uh, in the neighborhood of all these uh, you know, ancient settlements and so on. So this explains why uh, you know, we have these settlements on tops of the hill. Uh, it takes time because of uh, total station. Yes, this is the total station map which helped us, you know, uh, understand uh, the relationship between cultural uh, features and the natural landscape and also the sources of uh, you know, various types of raw materials and then uh, a close uh, you know, uh, observation that uh, ena enabled us to identify distinctive um, you know, activity areas in this area. Most of the workshops uh, uh, associated with stone axe manufacturing activity are found very in proximity to these uh, you know, uh, veins of dolerite which, which cut through this and as I said this was the major source of raw material for uh, polished stone axes and they were mined uh, and then transported to the remaining uh, settlements on, situated on the neighboring hills and so on. So this is also a, an area where we have dense occurrence of uh, neo, Neolithic to Iron Age rock art um, that we have uh, documented during the course of our project. So this is the site of uh, Sandaracha Maguta. Um, it was uh, well surrounded by a large number of tars um, in, in the 1940s. But in the subsequent years, uh, these stores have been, uh, you know, quarried away. But then this plateau surface is now open. Otherwise, it was, um, you know, well uh, surrounded by this natural fortification. And on this plateau, uh, Superov initiated uh, excavation. Uh, one trench was uh, below a rock shelter here, and another was in the center of this particular plateau. Later, uh, when Nagaraj Rao and Ansari uh, came back to this site, they took a number of these trenches and also reopened the trench which was dug by the Subarao and so on. And then subsequently, Professor Sankalya excavated in uh, one of the fields here, which is known as Bangal Tota, and he produced a publication published by Second College and so on. So this uh, activity areas, uh, you know, this was uh, not only um, <coughs> the settlement of the Neolithic uh, village, but the re investigations have clearly uh, revealed the presence of an ash pond prior to the uh, you know, establishment of a regular village here. And then at uh, the time when uh, Ashmont formation was taking place, this area was also subject to uh, you know, uh, manufacturing stone axes. And there's a lot of debitage coming from this uh, you know, uh, you know, substratum above the levels where we have typical Neolithic stone axes and uh, handmade pottery and so on and so forth. So we have an ash mound here. And then the post ash mound phase is reflected by is represented by the uh, habitation soils and the regular, you know, village here, and as reflected by the, um, you know, house floors which were excavated by uh, Ansari and Nagaraj Rao and so on. And then we have rock art. Um, on the granite boulders, uh, the frequency of rock art is low when compared to the frequency of uh, rock art on the dolerite dikes and so on. Uh, this is another hill, uh, Sadashiva Buddha. Uh, only on the plateau surface we have some of these. Uh, you know, bed, bedrock mortars and then occasional, uh, you know, um, debitage associated with stone axe manufacturing activity and a couple of uh, megalithic, um, you know, features are also seen here. Uh, then we have this uh, large hill, large number of these uh, megalithic structures here um, and it is basically bedrock. There is not much of habitation deposit on this hill, but this has been subject to, you know, a great deal of destruction by quarrying activity and so on. And next to that, there is a small hill where we have uh, <coughs> evidence of an ash mound, uh, which is also known as this small hill or what we call Suddhalamati Buddha and so on. Uh, so uh, when we started our project, our idea was to make sure uh, to reconfirm the observations made by earlier archaeologists and also see if we can add. And our focus was certainly bioarchaeology of these sediments in any case. 
So our excavations revealed uh, the features which were already noticed in, on a small scale, but now we were able to, uh, you know, expand these trenches uh, in a continuous manner and then trace the extent of this ash mod. So below uh, the on top of the bedrock, what we have here is the, you know, ash mod deposit, and then uh, at some point of time, ash mod formation ceases, and then we have the regular village expanding on top of this particular ash mod and so on. So soils, uh, uh, you know, associated with human activity has been sampled in, in several several tons and then uh, subject to flotation to recover plant remains as well as, uh, you know, animal remains and so on. And then to also carry out uh, systematic, uh, you know, study of uh, what we call micromorphology and then in, uh, draw inferences on climatic conditions and, and so on. So uh, you have, you still have these post holes. Of course, uh, the, the, the continuity of post holes is not seen here, but then they occur and also they are all circular in fashion and then you have the circular huts. We still have you know, such huts surviving in this area um, uh, uh, and then the simple huts were, you know, metal and off structures were constructed. So another, uh, you know, uh, view of the trench which also reveals the presence of an ash mound here and then on top of it you have this uh, habitation soil. Um, and so you have some pitting activity uh, in the later time period, uh, you know, and dug into the ash mound deposit and so on. Uh, on the large hill, this is this uh, large hill where we have the dolerite uh, exposure, uh, several stations were meant for procuring raw material for, uh, you know, modifying them into zone axis and so on. Along the sides also, you have these uh, small terraced surfaces or leveled surfaces, uh, which food described as made ground and so on. Uh, they extend, um, you know, uh, backwards onto the plateau, uh, and some of these areas we do find small, um, <coughs> you know, a remnant of a former, uh, you know, hut associated with the mining activity, and we do have evidence of uh, charcoal, evidence of a burial, and so on, even along this site. And when we go down, uh, now that it has been modified greatly because of mining activity, there were series of terraces at different levels, uh, which were also uh, places where, you know, settlements uh, occurred. This is that longitudinal profile of the hilltop. Uh, this is the southern end where we have the ash mound and then on top of the ash mound we have the, um, the debitas associated with stone axe manufacturing activity. And as you go upwards, what we see is series of circular features uh, where uh, these axe workshops, uh, you know, existed. And uh, they have, one of them has been a excavated and then we have a good chronology for the stone axe manufacturing activity and that actually perhaps can be extrapolated to all other um, you know circular features that we uh, have documented on the data surface here. So uh, again uh, as we can um, understand the source of raw material was here, the waste products were here and then the discarded ones are also on, on the surface scatter and then these bedrock features uh, gave us clues to Know, identifying um, areas of stone axe manufacturing activity and one such circular feature was excavated by us and there are a series of them on the plateau on either side and we have a small passage here and then at, at each one of these circular features on the edge we do come across these blocks of granite um, you know where we have the evidence of uh, uh, grinding grooves as well as cupules. So this triangular form stone axe uh, edges were uh, you know, sharpened through these grooves and then the butt end was rounded uh, through these cupules here. So we find them at each of these circular uh, you know, features that we have uh, documented here, uh, such pieces uh, indicating that in the immediate neighborhood of a workshop, this sharpening uh, was also carried out. And then the waste products accumulated on the plateau here and then they range in uh, depth or in thickness from anywhere between 50 centimeters to one and a half meters and so on. And then we have this uh, ash mound uh, below this particular hill. So on, here, on top of the hill, we have four ash mounds, and at the base of the hill, we have three ash mounds in this area. Uh, okay, then when our, one of the circular features was excavated, and it has yielded uh, <coughs> several lakhs of uh, you know, plates, uh, which are a debitat associated with uh, you know, stone axe manufacturing activity. As I mentioned, some of these granite blocks uh, give us a clear indication of the intensity of axe production taking place in this year. This is the most productive landscape uh, in the Sanganakalu area that we have seen, uh, especially when it comes to 
uh, the production of Neolithic stone axes. Uh, the radiocarbon date uh, for charcoal coming from southwest corner of this particular circular feature uh, uh, places this activity around 1400 BC. Uh, not at the early stage of the Neolithic in this uh, settlement, but at the later stage when large surplus was being produced, not only uh, stone axes but also this black and red ware, wheat grown uh, pottery was also produced. And then we do come across at this particular level uh, evidence for bead manufacturing activity and so on. So presence of charcoal has helped us establish the chronology of stone axe manufacturing activity and intensity, um, you know, going for more than 100 years at some of these, uh, you know, uh, circular workshop areas. So these workshops are very, very common. And fortunately for us, all the material which we dug out from this area is now being transported to the museum which we have established in the town of Bellary. And we are recreating this workshop. And uh, it not only yielded uh, the waste products, but also a number of, uh, you know, uh, well-made uh, ground stone axes at various stages of manufacture and so on. So the blocks of granite were procured from these outcrops, sorry, dolerite was procured from these outcrops, uh, initial skinning was carried out, rough triangular form was achieved, and then the deep, uh, you know, flaking was carried out, then this, this becomes thinner, and then it will be subject to grinding on these bedrock mortars, and then uh, if the intensity of grinding and the, um, you know, the surface features, the deep start become shallower and shallower and then continued uh, grinding results in uh, developing a smooth surface and then the final product um, is seen here. So you have the butt head here and the working edge and these edges were sharpened in those grooves that we have seen uh, you know, a number of instances. So these are bedrock mortars which were subject to uh, different degrees of uh, grinding. So shallow, uh, intermediate and very, very deep. So these coarser, you know, uh, texture of this granite uh, uh, as compared to the fine texture of some other bedrock master helps us understand the differential function performed, um, you know, at these points. So this perhaps was an area where uh, grinding of the stone axis was done and there are those bedrock mortars where we also find uh, corn crushers, rubbing stones and such other granitic artifacts, you know, um, used for processing grains and so on. Uh, the close-up of these grooves, V-shaped grooves, found across the entire landscape of more than 1,000 acres of land at uh, different points along the plateau, on the sides, and as well as at the base of the hills here. Uh, again, uh, with the uh, <coughs> availability of radiocarbon dates, and then a fresh uh, you know, understanding of the stratigraphy of cultural succession here, and uh, clear evidence for the uh, presence of an ash mound prior to the emergence of a Neolithic village um, and the uh, dates that we have, uh, AMS dates that we have for the um, material procured from these deposits, we have been able to trace the antiquity of settlement going back to about 2200 BC or so and uh, uh, ash mound phase is goes back to pre-2000 BC and then from 2000 BC onwards we have the village settlement and then from there, we have up to about 1500 BC, uh, we have the bead made pottery, megalithic ware, and then large scale manufacturing of activity. So this surplus being generated in material cultural products gives us clue to, you know, early, uh, you know, development of uh, uh, trade and exchange networks. And that also coincides with the introduction of food crops from outside this local area. And also gives us, uh, you know, uh, clues to about uh, the surplus being generated, uh, trade and exchange networks gradually giving rise to early phase of urbanization processes uh, set in motion by the um, I know, Iron Age, uh, you know, uh, late Neolithic, early Iron Age uh, communities in this area. So on, on the large hill also, uh, which was excavated and similar radiocarbon chronology has helped us. And then the ceramic, <coughs> black and red wear, sorry. Black and red ware uh, makes its presence from about 1400 BC onward. And we have this time period when we have the largest stone axe manufacturing activity taking place on the large hill um, at Sanganakallu. And again, you have an ash mound phase and then um, the followed by the village and then the, the major uh, you know, stone axe manufacturing activity and then transition to uh, early Iron Age and stone axe workshop and so on. Um, as I said, since the time of Robert Sewell and Fawcett and D.H. Gordon, Raymond Nelchin and uh, in members of our, um, you know, uh, team, 
I have been working on the rock art here, and the rock art is, a, is generally associated with the, the dolerite dike. There are more than 2,000 rock art elements, and uh, the imagery, bull imagery, has a special place in the landscape as well as amongst the you know the Neolithic folk uh, you know of Sanganakalu area. And interestingly, the animal bones, cattle bones found from habitation deposits, uh, clearly indicate uh, <coughs> that these were not subject to uh, human consumption. And in the habitation area, generally uh, the bones of sheep and goat are uh, found, and uh, uh, later chicken and so on. Uh, these rock art sites are associated with these ringing rocks. These are all dolerite blocks. And these cupules, if you systematically tap, tap them, you have a clear uh, rhythmic uh, you know, gong emanating from them. They are very closely associated with the rock art sites and uh, very closely associated with the imagery of bull and then uh, you know, chains of people performing some kind of uh, social, uh, you know, uh, cultural activity and so on. Perhaps music also played an important role in the life of these people and uh, uh, the fertility associated with the bull cult, uh, even till late, it survived. And as I mentioned briefly, this, uh, uh, the cattle bones um, were not, do not, taphonomical study of these bones do not show any indication of they being consumed as part of the human diet in this area. So uh, a close-up view of uh, these, uh, you know, what we call calcium carbonate or spring tufa, which is preserved in the fissures and cracks along the sides of the hill and on various, uh, you know, uh, uh, parts of the landscape here. And then uh, this, this gave us clue to the fact that perennial spring activity uh, was prosperous in this area during the late Holocene time period. And until about 50 to 100 years ago, this area was also rich with spring activity. Even today, there are, uh, you know, in, in the north, in the eastern part of uh, this region, we have active springs uh, in these granitic hills, uh, which are, these hills are even today uh, known for picnic activity uh, by weekenders. So this uh, gave us clear idea of why the settlements were situated on top of this. And the base of the hill was not suitable because it was all swampy uh, with a network of pools and ponds and so on. So large quantities of um, soils were processed for recovering faunal remains and also for recovering botanical remains. And then after they are sun dried, uh, they were taken to laboratory for analysis and identification and so on. So based on the archaeobotanical identifications um, uh, carried out by uh, Doreen Bullock and uh, <coughs> uh, the animal uh, remains studied by Stephanie Mace and uh, our associates, we have this uh, you know, information about the agricultural economy of uh, the Neolithic folk in this area. We have these four uh, crops, uh, uh, recurrent crops, they are primary staple crops, they are native to this area. So this uh, Samana landscape, you know, uh, were, uh, you know, very, very productive in terms of avail availability of these wild grasses, which were later, you know, uh, cultivated and domestic farms were, uh, you know, developed by the Neolithic uh, uh, communities inhabiting this area. So we have the Cetaria verticillata, or this leaf foxtail millet, and then we have uh, this uh, brown top millet, and then we have two important pulses, one is hot crab, and then mung bean. Little later in time, we do have evidence of black ram coming into uh, the economy of these people. By about 1500 BC, we have some of these African crops entering into this area uh, via North Deccan. And then we have Hassan bean coming from Africa. And then we have pearl millet, um, you know, via North Peninsula again. And then PGNP, uh, Buster and Southwestern Varissa is the source region. It also uh, finds a place in the agricultural economy of these people. And then uh, chicken also makes its presence uh, uh, from and it has its source in the northern part of India. And then gradually, what we see during the time period from 1400 BC onward, we see these developments taking place uh, in the archaeological record, reflecting upon early courses towards urbanization. That's what I want to use the term urbanization because otherwise, you know, South India was not known to be, uh, you know, experiencing urbanization until the emergence of Mauryas uh, and Shatwanas and so on. But the surplus being generated uh, perhaps gives us clues to ex extending the antiquity of urbanization uh, to 1300, 1400 BC time period. So we have uh, around that time more specialized lithic production. We have uh, the axe, uh, you know, large scale axe manufacturing activity uh, as documented from the large hill 
and then we have pyrotechnic bead production lapidaries uh, coming in the existence and then the craft specialization coming up and then we have occasional uh, evidence of copper uh, reworking of copper and then copper source is also not very far uh, from some of the sites and the site of Kudisini ash mound is one uh, which is located on top of the copper mountain of course the yield of copper is very very low but the entire range is rich for mix mineral and metal resources as we know and then of course iron ore resources are abundant in this area and then we get the first evidence of iron from the archaeological context here dating back to about 1000 years or so. So this uh, also, uh, this time period also witnesses the introduction of winter crops in this area. Uh, and so um, small scale, uh, you know, winter uh, crops uh, came to be cultivated in this area. And in addition to that, sandalwood and uh, such other uh, evidence for the production of fiber crops like, uh, you know, cotton and so on is reflected in the presence of uh, what we call spindle holes and so on from several of these sites. So these are some of the uh, examples of the horse cram, you know, um, pulses and the millets that we uh, recovered from uh, the archaeological context here. Uh, so based on this uh, chronology that we have and the suit of food crops that we have and the evidence relating to the domestication of sheep, goat, uh, chicken and then cattle, uh, we have now been able to argue for an independent uh, center of agricultural origin which was initially based on Ashmont tradition associated with the cultivation of local millets and pulses. And uh, through time, what we see is the spatial and uh, you know, uh, expansion of this Neolithic culture. And then the Ashmont tradition comes to end around uh, 1400 BC in this year, uh, in this area. And as we move eastward into Andhra Pradesh, by about 1900 BC, we have eastward expansion of the Neolithic context. Uh, but the landscapes are very, very different. We have rock shelter Neolithic occupations, cave Neolithic occupations, of course open air stations and so on. And they have a regional pottery which is known as Patapadu Ware. And so there are a large number of sites uh, densely uh, distributed in the eastern part of this uh, Royal Asima area, which is uh, uh, a geologically uh, a, a part of the Karnul Basin, a proterozoic basin which is known for uh, quartzite, uh, shale, limestone and so on, the famous uh, caves of Billasargam are situated here. And in the vicinity of Billasargam cave also we have come across evidence for Neolithic habitation of uh, caves and so on. So this eastward expansion uh, is a regional variant which uh, takes place around 1900 BC and post-1900 BC. And so we, based on uh, distinctive pottery tradition, uh, this way has been designated Kundir. So as I mentioned, most of the sites that we have in this core area of Ashmont tradition uh, date from about 2500 BC or so, and one or two sites have given clues to about uh, older dates. Sites, for example, Watagal, which has uh, given indications of uh, the antiquity of Neolithic going back to 3000 BC or so. But yet, we have not come across a site where transition from hunting gathering to early agricultural way of life uh, take, took place. And perhaps uh, we suspect this region, especially the, the north bank of the Krishna Ways, in the Telangana region, the Mahbub Nagar area is likely a region where perhaps, uh, you know, there are archaeological sites, no doubt, uh, uh, you know, <coughs> warranting investigations. And perhaps this is one potential area where one can trace this transition from hunting gathering to um, early agricultural way of life. And so that uh, we understand the processes, cultural processes that were operating from earlier than 3000 BC to till the beginning of Iron Age in this area. So we have the sites like Halluru uh, in this region, Halluru tradition uh, <coughs> on the banks of Tungabhadra, uh, close to the Western Ghat. And then for the southwards as we move into the plains of Tamil Nadu, uh, we have early Iron Age settlement uh, carrying this Neolithic stone axe technology and then establishing um, you know, widespread settlements across the plains of uh, northern Tamil Nadu and so on. So plant subsistence based across three cultural zones uh, has been reconstructed. This related geographical variables because of geology and soils and so on. And then environmental setting, uh, you know, is reflected in the uh, wood charcoal. And then we have chronology, which helps us establish uh, the temporal and spatial expansion of these Neolithic traditions and so on. Uh, so as I mentioned, this is perhaps the potential area for future archaeological research where we can trace this transition from hunting gathering to early agriculture. Thank you very much. Uh, special thanks to the authorities of Deccan College 
and I am proud to be an alumnus of Deccan College. Thank you, sir. Yeah. So, can I try, I think? Yes, sir. Uh, More than enough. It to listen to such an informative lecture. Uh, can uh, can we have a few questions if someone sure, would sure. like to ask? Sure, sure. Welcome. Does anybody have any questions? They can also write in the chat box if there are questions available. I don't see any in the chat back here. Any students would like to ask some questions? Please feel free to ask. Yeah, they are leaving actually. Wow, they have one up one by one. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> so second, your. Yes, there is one. Suraj Yadav, sir, second organization in Captain. You say second your organization, Mudikan. Means he is agreeing with me. <laughs> Suraj, do you want to ask some question? continues to occur um, in the, uh, near, you know, in at other, at other sites where we have a Iron Age, uh, you know, habitation level. So we have this wheel made black and red ware, made from very fine navigated clay, um, and then bichrome pottery, um, you know, open kill, um, and then we don't get uh, this other subsidiary ways for the continuation of what we see in the Neolithic period. But until the beginning of uh, the megalithic uh, wheel made black and red ware, most of the Neolithic pottery um, across the end, uh, vast you know, area, geographical area covered by this Neolithic, we do have only um, you know, handmade pottery. Um, so black and red ware bichrome pottery uh, is the one standard one that we come across in the Iron Age context, whether it is Brahmagiri or Sanganakalu or any other site in the region. Any, any source, uh, no, surplus is one of the important um, uh, criteria. Surplus is produced you know, in variety of material, cultural goods that were produced. This is the most productive land, uh, productive landscape that we have come across in that area. And uh, urbanization need not be reflected in monumentalization, monumentalization of the landscape. There are, you know, as uh, B. Gordon Child, you know, pre prepared a checklist of items which can, which are part and parcel of an urbanization or urban or Bronze Age revolution. We see here, uh, urbanization need not be uh, comparable. Uh, the, the characteristics of urbanization seen in one area need not be, uh, you know, 100 percent repeated in another area. So we have these early beginnings very clearly reflected in the large scale production. Why at all surplus was being displayed, you know, produced? It not only happens 
in the areas of material goods but also introduction intensity what we call intensive agriculture even winter cultivation also begins in this area with the introduction of crops like wheat and barley and uh, you know um, <coughs> african beans and so on which are winter crops winter crops in this area so it is not only summer monsoon kharif agriculture but we also have this uh, rabi also and then the settlement stability is very clearly reflected uh, from about uh, 1400 bc and the size of the settlements also begin to increase so there was demographic processes also operating at this point of time does that answer you carbon date for vertical is not beyond 2700 bc and it only indicates indicates that it is even the settlement may go back uh, to 3000 bc but these are all now guesses because one this is why we are looking for early sites where we can trace the transition that is a question about yeah 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 yeah
that for the uh, the efficiency, you no, know, in that for efficiency also goes ahead some of the evidences uh, we have found in, in this part of uh, say southern India. There are evidences mm -hmm. which are earlier than that, and the evidence for the the, the wild species of efficiency they are also consumed today in parts of Western Ghats. There are there are other species like uh, uh, as well as Echinocea, you know, yeah. There are several other species, wild species, so it is possible that this could have originated also in parts of uh, say Western Ghats, and then it was. Uh, 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 sure, sure. Let's say the ecosystem to right. Uh, South India. So this is a very wider question, and the thing is that we have we have plenty of evidence from these regions to suggest that uh, when we talk about the origin of these particular species, we have to take into consideration the fact that. <laughs> because we made a statement like this, it is now possible to think otherwise. Yeah. You know, if we don't make a statement, then nobody will worry about you know, you know, getting into the antiquity where is it, whether it is this place or that place. But our evidence, the time frame that we have, is not older than 2400 BC. And what is the best part is the, the, the yeah. radiocarbon date that you have got. Yes. But yes. The best part of it because that, but unfortunately, along with the radiocarbon dates, we don't have the transitional stages. Also has to be uh, uh, taken, taken into consideration. So, so we need archaeologists. We need the archaeologists to go into this particular. Uh, <laughs> uh, Dr. Um, uh, Boris Becker, I mean, right. going to be one of my early students from early 70s because he was a student of first batch. I mean, uh, in 1972. So yeah, we entered the Deccan College on the same day. Yes, we entered the. <laughs>
So, Professor Cole said that. Thank you. Yes, should we call it a day? Yes. Uh, I, think. <laughs> I think there are no more questions. No and okay. on this occasion, I really would like to uh, give my heartfelt, sincere thanks to you for giving us this very informative lecture. It was uh, very nice to see all those slides and uh, all those uh, images of Sanganakalu. It was like going back to my, you know, the MA days or yeah, uh, reading about the ash mounds and brought back a lot of memories. So um, uh, on this uh, note, um, I just request our Vice Chancellor or Professor Mohan, if anybody is still around, I don't know. Uh, Professor Mohan, are you there? Yes, I am there. Yes. Sir. Thank you. 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 Okay, thank you. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, uh, so, I was outside the region is very difficult to be delivered by Professor Kumba Kundan on 8th January. Before the end of the month, we have a committee and thank you all for attending this night. I was glad to come for the meeting. Professor Kumba Kundan for the morning. Thank you very much. And after that, thank you. Leave the meeting. Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you, sir.